Well, this is something about diagonalization, as you heard. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Thank you very much, though, for having me here. I'm really excited to be at an Abinet workshop. Um, I think I heard Xavier talk in 2001 for the first time about Avenit. This was a, the workshop in Avignon when there was just no September 11 or yes, during. Yes, and a young Gerd Seder was talking about battery materials and various other very young people talked about other things including about Avenit. And um, so I followed the project somewhat since then initially more than later less. So probably um, some of you know that I'm in the wrong movie because I usually need lead another talk and I'll come to that later. But there is um, opportunity for collaboration and that's really uh, why I'm here on, at the library level. And so the title of the talk is Infrastructure Developments for Electronic Structure Codes in LC. And that's the Electronic Structure Infrastructure. My name is Volker Bloom and these days I'm a, apparently a mechanical engineer because I'm in the me Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, in the United States. And so what I'll try to do is too many things, you will find out. So I will fall off uh, the edge of the uh, talk or time uh, after some time uh, for this talk. But I'll try to introduce what is this electronic structure infrastructure, LC, and why we can uh, use it. Um, uh, then some things that it enables, which is benchmarking solvers on equal footing. So what do we solve here? Uh, it's about eigenproblems, as you heard. So this is the generalized eigenvalue problem. And this appears in various forms in every electronic structure code. So in our case, uh, and I'll say in a moment that I am from an all-electron code, if it aims, we have a dense eigenvalue problem, need a relatively high number of eigenvectors, so we need algebraic solvers. Uh, in plane waves, you have a lot of basis functions, need relatively few of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for the SEF cycle anyway, so you can uh, do an iterative solver. But in general, we all have this problem at some level, and so um, once you run out of the uh, scaling limit of the eigensolver, either in parallel or in terms of number of atoms, at some point there are other solvers out there. So here I note, for instance, ELPA, which is a, an order n cubed eigenvalue solver that works very well in parallel, in which I was also involved a couple of years ago uh, uh, trying to make that work. But uh, once you run out of scaling, there are other things called PEXI, for instance, which is the pole expansion and selective inversion method by Lin Lin that scales as order n squared at most in principle, but for LDA and GGA, so it has some restrictions. But if you can use it, it should scale to larger systems. Or anti-poly, which is in fact a new um, implementation of sparse um, matrix algebra. This is very interesting because there are few um, uh, implementa implementations of sparse matrix algebra around, and they use this for order n methods in uh, uh, quantum chemistry. Um, and so if you have a band gap, you can use that and so on. But in, in principle, if you have a code, so there are four codes that actually use this uh, LC, I think in their uh, production versions at this point, so FHR Ames, but also Siesta and DFTB Plus and uh, DGDFT, and this is open to anybody else. The main restriction, I think, is human time, as in developer time. And you, you connect to three or more solvers, then you already have 12 alternatives. And for each one, you have to uh, implement a different interface, and somebody else does that work. And so this becomes complicated. And so LC tries to serve as this interface layer and hopefully also eventually to um, help users choose the right solver, if possible, without too much uh, user intervention. And so once you have that, you can also do benchmarks like this for a wa large water unit uh, cell. And so I chose deliberately here DFTB plus, a code with which I have absolutely no involvement except knowing that it's around and liking the developers, which is semi-empirical. And so you can see that this red line, which we'll come back later, which is the um, ELPA library as a function of number of atoms here, um, at this point scales better than PEXI for some reason, uh, but uh, the order n solver beats that because the matrices are very sparse and so an order n solver is better. And so you can do these um, comparisons on equal footing. And finally, I'll try to come to that in the end of my talk. There is of course the world of iterative solvers. So we first got interested in this because um, I was actually hoping to use this for uh, the beta Zalpeta equation at some point and still do, but in the plane wave world, this is, of course, a much bigger problem. So if you have a matrix that you cannot build, of course, you do a matrix vector product and work like this. And you can do an iterative solver and all as well, uh, except um, you need to implement it. And so what this here does is actually a, a use of LC in reverse. So it's a reverse communication interface where LC implements the high level steps of the algorithm, but um, then asks the developer of the user code to implement the low level steps. So for instance, 
we need a matrix vector product and this is good uh, but how you define this matrix vector product will be dependent on the code that you have before you so maybe quantum espresso distributes its matrices differently or vectors than uh, abinit and maybe uh, exciting does it in yet a different way and so um, we can't rewrite the entire low level infrastructure of abinit or quantum espresso or exciting but what we can offer is uh, uh, that the user just puts this operation in and at least the high level algorithm will work and so in that case Elsie gives the task the code performs the low level task pushes back the result to Elsie and goes on like this so this is a newer development that is also coming up so before I do all this I should thank uh, the people who are responsible for this so in spite of time I decided to put the historical introduction in it because there's a secondary message this was actually born by an email from Emilio Artacho that came in 2014 and I suspect some others in the room also got that email that said something like, dear all, there will be a workshop at SECAM at Lausanne aiming to kickstart an electronic structure library. I hope I, you're interested. So I was interested because we already had the Alpa library and so we wanted to go further in terms of libraries. Um, but this is a, a question of how to do this. So we actually uh, put together a, an NSF proposal which was funded and so I have to thank these program managers of the NSF um, uh, software infrastructure for sustainable innovation. Uh, uh, program a lot because this is a program that actually understands scientific software development and tries uh, to make it possible and so uh, myself John Feng Lu of Duke University Lin Lin, Lin, Lin in Berkeley uh, Xiao Yang also in Berkeley Alvaro Vasquez Mayo Gautier in um, uh, uh, Argonne National Lab and, and Fabiano Corsetti who's now uh, at Synopsis uh, quantum wise and got together and tried to uh, put something together that was called LC the people who really made it work are these people here so in particular for the interface Victor Yu is incredibly good and usually he gives the talks also the invited talks not I so this is uh, one of the rare occasions when, when I don't speak so he's a fourth year PhD student now but he's really amazingly good at all things parallel linear algebra distributing things on a supercomputer and I think he can use any supercomputer on the planet and get meaningful results uh, Ying Zhu Li is the person in Zhang Feng Lu's group who's actually done uh, the reverse communication interface so this is really his accomplishment. Will Hoon has done a lot of stuff also around ELSI uh, in my group uh, and others uh, that push this forward and then all these people here are people who have contributed uh, uh, to the project a lot uh, or less over time but all of them have and so this is a larger effort that we hope to keep going and as I said before there is actually this Emilio Artacha email which is about the electronic structure library and so without the electronic structure library we would be nowhere really so this is an effort although it's not very widely um, uh, loudly publicized yet should be publicized more and it's basically uh, a number of developers from different codes and communities coming together every year and trying to code on libraries that are of common interest and so the most famous ones are probably LibXC uh, LC and, and various uh, solvers underneath it are of course also there but a lot of others that are in principle useful and most importantly perhaps make it more easy to distribute electronic structure codes to end users in the end uh, because you can use this as a distribution that's at least what I hope and so without Michael Oliveira, Jan Puyong who's here, Fabiano in fact, Nick Papior and many more this, this would not be possible and so I'm hoping that this ESL bundle which should appear officially uh, later this year really will be adopted by, by, by others uh, in the community. So. Um, this is my other day job I just mentioned this briefly because this justifies the choice of matrices so as I said I'm in the wrong movie uh, I uh, usually develop the FHR Ames code and I try to, to lead this with, with uh, several other people uh, uh, which originated at FHRA, at FHRI in Berlin it's an all-electron code it has numeric atom centered basis functions so localized basis functions and that's perhaps the most important point uh, to make here otherwise we hope to have high numerical accuracy and I think we do uh, for production type systems so for very large systems they can be non-periodic periodic and equal footing we do density functional theory various other things and the scalability has been an issue this is of course relevant for LC in a moment because we'd like to do large systems and we can so this goes to some of the top supercomputers and it also has its own community of developers that is relatively distributed but as I said when it comes to the underlying code we share a lot of um, underlying interests not least but it's quite boring to be stuck in your tower uh, of code for many years and never get out unless to co convince your colleagues that you wrote a great publication and then they come back and say but I wrote an even better one so talking about the low level details of code and what they do um, is actually a nice thing and so this is what the ESL also uh, enables because you suddenly talk about the same code and the same methods and how to make progress on these beyond the confines of a single project that's really a nice thing so this is the problem again 
the eigenvalue problem I already said. We have different use cases, basis sets, physics, uh, different solvers that are out there, many of them. Uh, you could uh, solve the eigenvalue problem order n cubed, or you can actually try to circumvent it and solve for the density matrix, and this in the best of cases is order n. And so we have solvers like LAPAC, ScalaPAC, ELPA, or EigenExa, or MAGMA on GPUs that are all sort of exact order n cubed solvers. They're robust in general, but they're order n cubed uh, scaling. Iterative solvers, I don't think I have to say much about, about these here, they're essentially robust, except if you need many eigenvectors out of your spectrum, they're not competitive with these here. If you need few eigenvectors, um, they are competitive, but some of them, like Davidson, still go back at some point and solve some kind of nuclear eigenvalue problem by an uh, order n cubed solving, uh, scaling eigensolver anyway. Uh, there are the order n solvers. The most interesting one from my point of view at this point is actually anti-poly because it's out there and it's usable and it works. Um, but there are the other density matrix based approaches that are not necessarily quite uh, order n, but for instance, PEXI works for metallic systems, and so this is useful. Um, orbital minimization method is something that Fabiano Corsetti re-implemented from the Siesta code a few years ago, so we were playing with that for a long time. Feast is something that Eric Polizzi does in the US uh, for many years at very high level, and so this is also something to watch, and many more. Uh, but how do we fare? So the practical solution is to just use an order in cubed eigensolver for your eigen problem and not care, and so you can do this. And as you can see, Alvaro approved this on the Theta machine in uh, uh, Argon. You can solve, a, you can diagonalize an eigenvalue problem exactly uh, in well, a few hours up to a million by a million uh, dimension uh, if you have a big enough computer, in this case, uh, 200,000 CPU cores, uh, K and L. And so this worked. So clearly you can do something with this, but perhaps this gets a little bit expensive uh, if you try to go to, to more atoms. But maybe 50,000 atoms, all electrons should be possible uh, with this, uh, no problem. Now, if you go beyond this, as I said before, you might have to switch to a different solver. And that different solver has to be connected to different electronic structure codes. And so you have lots of optional solvers out there that are actually available as libraries. But you need to replicate the infrastructure in all different codes to connect to these solvers efficiently. Matrix storage conversion, especially on large, massively parallel machines, is an underestimated problem. You can do this very efficiently, but you also have a way to do it very efficiently. And finally, there's the complexity in solver selection for different problems. So, as I said, you can just do the million by million diagonalization, but perhaps we should have used Spexy for that instead, right? Uh, so the solution is a conversion layer, and so this basically is LC. And the hopefully useful part is that it has simple interfaces um, that, uh, that allow you to connect generically and also switch solver types if you like, if it's been implemented. Matrix conversion is efficient in this and actually works. Uh, and uh, we're working on recommendations for optimal solver choices that can be done. At least you can rule out some for certain problems quite effectively. Um, so currently this is used by four codes, uh, but, but, but there will hopefully be more. Um, this is basically what the API looks like. You initialize the whole thing. You can actually reinitialize for a geometry run if your parameters change like your dimensions and eventually you finalize and the calls are relatively simple and they, they, they work with uh, Fortran, C, C++. Uh, if you wish, uh, that's what you can connect to in Python in principle as well. Um, and uh, the design is really for, for rapid integration into an existing uh, electronic structure code. Um, this is what Victor claims he did after he implemented the anti-poly connection into LC, what he did in the FHI Ames code. So he claims 10 lines. Well, I didn't count, but this is the commit uh, that he made to make anti-poly work. And so this was relatively simple at that stage because the ELPA solver and the others were, of course, already supported. So you can really deploy relatively fast. And this is tested on all sorts of uh, compiler suites. It runs on all sorts of supercomputers, provides these interfaces, and is part of the electronic structure library. This is very close to the end of my time. So I showed you a benchmark before. that was run on various supercomputers by, uh, by, by NERSC, uh, by Victor here. And so just uh, to show another benchmark here is a benchmark of 1D, 2D, 3D systems because sparsity depends on dimensionality, of course, uh, for different materials, heavy element materials, in fact, germanium nanotubes, molybdenum disulfide layers, uh, and a copper barium sulf tin sulfide uh, semiconductor material that I recommend for photovoltaics. Um, uh, and you can see that if you take the number of atoms in each model, so this is a few thousand uh, here, and you take the wall clock time here, Alpha is the, the, the red line, that's the order n cubed eigensolver. Um, the blue line is PEXI, it's faster for large, low dimensional sparse systems. You can see that for sparse systems, PEXI absolutely wins. Um, 
for the 1D system, for the 2D system, they're some, somewhat on par on this number of CPU cores. Pexy will win if you have more cores, actually, it scales better. And then finally, for the 3D systems, they're not so different in this case, which is already a success. So Pexy will actually, in fact, outscale uh, most other methods simply because it's very scalable. And so if you have more cores, this is helpful. With that, I'll switch very briefly to the last second of my talk. And uh, for this, I want to move here. to Hydro, uh, to, to Yingzhu, sorry, not Hydro, to Yingzhu, uh, who worked on the um, iterative solvers. And so, as you know, there are plenty of iterative solvers out there. I'm sure there are multiple ones in Abinit. Here is the Davidson algorithm just for proof of concept, where you basically get rid of the matrix and just do matrix vector uh, products. And then eventually you solve one uh, eigenvalue problem uh, by diagonalization exactly. But as I said before, this is a problem because you can't do the low-level operations for a code yourself. You can't replicate this. So what you do instead is you have an RCI and that drives the code. So the code initializes the RCI. The RCI gives the instruction. The code performs that instruction. This goes back until it's converged and you do the post calculation. And so in practice, uh, Yingzhu says this looks like this. You basically give your job a number. So you could have multiple instances of this next to one another. And you call the RCI solver and which, which particular solver you call is up to you. The solver gives you a task. You, as the programmer, fill in the task. So this is serial linear algebra, just as an example. But you might want to actually replace this with your own calls for parallel linear algebra, depending on how your data are distributed. So this is the thing you have to program in your own code and for your own data layout. Then you go back and get the next task and so on until the solver is done. So this is a generic way of implementing iterative solvers. Hopefully useful. Yingzhu spent a lot of work on it, so I think it's worth trying. And uh, just for proof of concept, he has a 64-atom silicon supercell here with various parameters. I believe this comes from uh, quantum espresso, uh, uh, the matrices. And you can see that in this case, the Davidson uh, solver, as he implemented it, is actually fastest. But this is something you can try out. It works. And so this gets me to the summary. Um, so the key point is that this is a unified software interface for massively parallel solvers of many types. So as soon as you run out of steam with the uh, order and cubed eigen solver, this is something to look uh, into. I think it's adopted by multiple codes. The hope is that this is also going to be uh, an open infrastructure going forward where people actually contribute and, and basically and we have a way to uh, compare methods uh, on equal footing and also put them in where they're best. And this is helpful. Uh, it's funded by all these people, uh, so without them we would be nowhere, and I uh, thank you very much for your attention.